Check this out. Right when I was starting to lose a little bit of faith in this, I am really confused and really happy about what I'm looking at. Hello, thanks for tuning in, and if you're new to the channel, Figure It Outie is all about working on Audis and trying out new products and tools. What I'm bringing you today is the most thorough test of Liquimali's Proline Engine Flush. On a side note, this is actually the very last video that I'll be doing in this garage. If you don't know what I'm talking about, there's a garage rebuild project right around the corner and this beautiful space is about to get knocked down next week. You should catch up on the series and watch the first episode up in the eye right now. Truthfully speaking, the B7 here hasn't really been driven in about two years. Between moving a few times and having the Corolla on hand for my really short local commutes, this car doesn't get a lot of wear and the oil in the engine probably only has a few thousand kilometers on it but I want to change it anyways. But at the same time, I figured, why not give it a clean? And I've had my eye on Liquimali Engine Flush for quite a while now, but I really want to put its claims to the test. And when I say tested, I don't just mean its cleaning ability. I know that's the sexy one that everyone wants to know if it works and is reviewed the most often, but I'm talking about the broad range of results that Liquimali says ProLine Engine Flush can do. And these tests are going to be the ones that can be done in the short term and with pretty basic methods and tools. Let's take a quick look at the product, understand what its claims are, and how I'll be testing them. So in terms of a Liquimali product, it's got a black cap, and that's their color coding system to communicate that this should be used within engine oil, and it's a ProLine product. And that means basically it's not for your everyday consumer, more like for shop use, but obviously it's widely available to consumers and you can use it at home. So basically it's a detergent, and some of the layman's terms used by Liquimali's own promo material for this product include phrases like liquefy deposits and oil soluble and insoluble residue is brought into suspension. Now, I don't know how to tangibly check for that, but I do see on the back of the label that there are a number of claims that I can test. What you're seeing now is information cut directly from Liquimali's website for the Engine Flush product, and I've highlighted each area of improvement that they talk about and then numbered the outcomes that I'll be testing for. Improves hydraulic function. That would be a great result, and I hope that's the case. For us, that would be the variable timing provided by the N205 valve, but would be just as applicable if you're watching this video. If you have a Toyota, that's the VBT, or BMW's Venos, or Honda's VTEC, stuff like that. But this isn't going to be a factor I'm testing for, though. Cleans the engine from the inside. This is the sexy promise that gets the most attention for sure. And if you look at these before and after screenshots from Liquid Molly's video, the change looks overly dramatic to me, where the before cams look like they've been greased and the after image makes the cams look worn but so clean that there isn't any oil standing on them at all. But we're going all the way in on this review and I'll be removing the valve cover before and after the cleaning to see the difference. Removes deposits from lubrication holes, oil screens, piston ring zone, etc. I'll be testing this claim in two different ways. The first will be looking for the deposits by taking a sample of the current used oil and then a sample of the flushed oil, and then I'll strain both of them through your average 20-ish micron filter to see if there's a visible difference in the captured deposits. The second way will be to check the cylinder and piston condition as best as I can, probably with a borescope, before and after the flush. I'll rotate the crank to move each piston down in order to see the cylinder wall condition in the area that the oil ring on the piston travels past. Reduces engine noise. This one's simple and I've done it before. I'll just be using the same decibel meter app on my phone based on idle noise at operating temperature, both inside and outside the car from consistent locations. And reduces oil consumption. This one will take time to test and I can't complete it in a single video, nor do I have a current baseline, so I'm going to skip the test, but assuming the cleaning allows the piston rings to create a better seal from combustion inside the cylinder, I'm willing to bet that this claim is true, but on average, probably not a huge decrease in consumption would be seen. But please leave a comment if you've done this or you're doing it right now and you're tracking your oil consumption because I'd love to know how it's going. Improves compression. This one I'm excited for because I've never done a compression test on this car before and I'll be doing a dry compression test in every cylinder before and after the cleaning using my new Mighty Vac compression tester. I like new tools. And finally, increases vehicle's reliability. Allows the fresh oil to develop its full performance after an oil change. I think in generality this is likely true enough to just trust. The cleaner the engine, the purer that the new oil that goes in will stay, and the more effective it and the oil-dependent parts of the engine will be. Okay, I know that was a lot. Thanks for hanging in there. 
It's all in the name of objective testing though, and speaking of which, I'm going to be filling in this table as we go with the results that we get. First up is the engine noise test. So I'll get the car warmed up to operating temperature as told by the coolant temperature reading. And then what I'll do is I'll take my same phone and the same app that I normally use for stuff like this. And I'll take a decibel reading out here next to the engine and then one in the cabin. You know I got to catch the cold start though. And the results are in. I got 66 average decibels by the engine bay and then 38 decibels inside the car. Moving straight into the compression test while the engine's still warm, even though I've turned off the car, the oil's at a minimum testing temperature for a compression test of at least 30 degrees Celsius. And there's good amounts of warmth in the block, the head, and on the cylinder walls, we should have a really nice coat of oil below the oil ring. First I want to run the fuel system dry though because we don't want more fuel being pumped into the cylinders when we're doing our compression test. And I'm going to do that by pulling the fuse for the fuel pump out of the car and then I'll just run the car and just let it die. And then the ignition will be disconnected just by the virtue of having all the plugs and coil packs removed. To get at the fuse panel, all you need to do is remove this one side piece of the dashboard by the driver's seat. I'm using my Schwabin trim tools again to remove that without marking up the plastic. And all you need to do is get down here and put a tool in that little hole right there and then pop off the bottom and then there's another clip about here and another one up here. On the inside of the panel you'll see that Audi provided a fuse removal tool which is really handy and then down in the list here we're going to pull out number 28 for the fuel pump. The coil packs are out removed using Audi service tool 2x ZIPTIE. They're actually really handy. Interestingly enough, I've got one different coil pack. It's no big deal. I actually have four red tops that I'm going to be putting in later at a different video, but the more you know. To pull out the spark plugs, I was saving this for another video, but I picked up a six inch extension for a 5.8 spark plug removal tool. It's from Schwaben, and it said that the magnetic inside to it is pretty strong, so let's see if that works. Works like a charm. Although, now that I'm looking at the spark plug, and I did note that it smelled a little bit crispy when I pulled out this coil pack too, it might be running a little hot. I have to refer back to the service manual to see if the tip of this spark plug tells me anything that I should know, but I'm going to keep this in mind for replacement in the future. All the plugs are removed, and the compression tester here is plugged into the first cylinder, and I'm going to go ahead now and do five cranks on the starter, and I'll let you watch the first one here, and then we'll look at the reading, and then I'll just do the other three. Cylinder one came in at, we can call it 169. That's not as good as I wanted it, but that's okay. The acceptable range is anywhere between 160 and 200 PSI for the two liter. I finished up the last three and obviously something surprised me on cylinder four. It's not holding compression very well, reading around 131. That is not necessarily outside of the max limit of difference that the two liter can have. 44 PSI is the maximum difference. The wear limit is around 100, not that I think you'd ever want to be that low. So technically these numbers aren't awful, but obviously something is going wrong. So what I decided to do next was to do a wet test. So if you don't know what that is, you just put a little bit of oil into the cylinder and test it again. That oil seeps down over the face of the piston and over to the rings and it helps create a seal. And then you do the compression test again. And those numbers are always going to be higher but you're just looking for the same type of trend that you saw on the dry test. So again, cylinder four was low, not quite as low as before. So I'm still a little bit concerned. It's about 20 PSI difference on average. So we're gonna try to figure out what that is in the future, but for now we have our trend line, so let's move on. Since the engine's still a little bit warm, that's good. I'm gonna go down and grab my first sample of used oil from the pan and I'll get it filtering on the bench and then we'll take a look at what the average amount of settled deposits in the pan are. The sample I pulled wasn't the dirtiest oil I've ever seen before. Makes sense. I knew there wasn't tons of kilometers on this batch. Nonetheless, it's filtering through the paper now, and we'll see what's left on top. Okay, so the oil is all filtered through. Let's take a look at the oil sample, and then if we can see any deposits that were collected on the filter paper. So looking at the oil, and I'll put some bright light against it. I'd say this looks pretty standard, pretty dark brown, kind of green looks consistent, looks very much like used oil that I've seen. In terms of the paper, 
Well, there's a mosquito leg in there because this is Alberta. A hair from my face, probably. And then when you look really close, there are little flecks of brown, kind of chunky stuff. But really, it looks quite clean. Finally, to be really thorough in our testing, we need to look inside the engine a bit. So since we have the ignition system detached, all we need to do now to look under the valve cover is just remove a few things from the PCV system, breather hose, a couple of bolts on the front timing cover, and of course the bolts along the valve cover itself. And we're gonna lift this thing off and take a look at the cams. The valve cover is off. I was really careful to stay organized on the way out so I wouldn't screw anything up later. And other than the junk that I knocked in while I was taking off the cover, things look as clean as I was hoping for anyways. So obviously there's some oil staining, but it's really consistent. And looking down into the head, there aren't any irregular deposits of uh, darkened oil spots. It's all pretty consistent looking, which is good. That means this test is going to be fair. We should see a nice consistent clean from the state that we see now. This final part of the test is going to be really interesting for two reasons. The first one is as it pertains to the test that we're doing. What I want to do is rotate the assembly to push each piston down towards its relatively bottom dead center. And I've got a socket and wrench down on the crank pulley, so I'm going to rotate it that way. And it's kind of cool because since we have the valve cover off, I can actually just watch the lobes push down the intake valves and I'll kind of know where the piston's at. But once each piston is down, we'll take a look at the sidewalls that would normally be under the oiling ring, and we'll see what the condition of that is. But secondly, because we had the compression issues, once those intake valves are pushed all the way down, I'll throw an attachment on the bore scope, and we'll try our best to look at the top side of the intake valves and see if we've got some carbon issues on our hands. Okay, I'll be as steady as possible, and let's go on a journey together to the bottom of cylinder one. So on the way in here... Yeah, we can see the edges of the intake valves, and they look nice and clean, which is good. That's what I would have expected for the compression results that we saw. They're clean, which means that they're making at least a decent seal. So let's move on down a bit. And we obviously see a lot of carbon buildup on the piston face and on the cylinder walls as well. I don't have much angle of articulation, but what we can see from where the piston meets the cylinder wall is that it's all dirty. So hopefully what we'll see in the results are that where the edge of the piston meets the cylinder wall, that area will be a little bit cleaner. All this coping is complete. You saw me do number one live, and now you're looking at on screen the valves from cylinder two and the piston faces and walls of cylinder two valve cylinder three, piston faces and wall cylinder three, and then finally cylinder four valves and piston faces and walls there too. So from what I saw and my angles with the boroscope weren't amazing and I couldn't get a really good look on top of the valves for each of the cylinders, I would say generally speaking there's a lot of carbon buildup in all the same places in all the same cylinders. So a carbon cleaning is in my future, at which point I'll do another compression test on top of the final results of this video. But for now, we've got all of our baselines, so let's get to work. As I button things up again so we can get to the flush, I do have to change a few parts, and I just want to call it out to be fair, and it might impact the results a little bit, so let's talk about it. So I will be changing the valve cover gasket. There shouldn't be any change on our results there. But you saw me pull out the plugs and packs, and I showed you the plug for cylinder one. Once I referred back to the Haynes manual, there's two things that I noticed about what's going on here. So first note that when plugs are running too hot, they get a little bit of the white material on the bridge above the electrode. And on all of them, we have that happening to some degree. But additionally, you can tell that this plug was running extremely hot. On top of that, you can see the carbon fouling that's happening on the tops of all the plugs. And that's absolutely no surprise based on what we've seen through the bore scope in each cylinder now. I checked the spark plug gap with my tool here and the OEM spec for the 2 liter engine is 0 0.028 inches and on average all these plugs were running 0 0.035 or even all the way up to 0 0.045 so none of them were gapped properly either. That and the electrodes have worn down a little bit which has changed the gapping. 
And here's the new hotness going back in. So I'll be swapping in these four coil packs that are the red R8 style ones because they're pretty sweet. But tangibly, I'm changing to a double platinum plug from Bosch. And we already know that all the gappings are out here. So to some degree, this test isn't going to be perfectly fair. I'm going to gap these a little bit higher than the OEM spec. So instead of 0.028 inches, I'm going to go to 0.032. And that's regarded as a bit of a better gap for the 2-liter engine. And we just know that this will be different in the test and possibly affect the noise reduction. But this is the facts. It is cleaning time. So the fuse is back in the panel, everything's buttoned up in the engine here, and all I'm going to do is start the car and get it up to operating temperature again, and then I'll take the engine flush, put it in the oil, and let the engine run for 10 minutes. Then I'll catch you on the cool down when I'm draining the oil. The oil was drained, I took my sample, did a filter, and here's what we have. Looking at the color, it looks to be very much the same. Dark brown, a little bit of green. Surface looks the same as well. It's not like there's a whole layer of extra stuff floating in there that came out during the cleaning. I'd say it looks pretty standard. Looking at the filter, I do see we have a couple little chunks of things, and I'll try to show that properly on camera. But nothing significant. Still looks very similar to the filter paper that we took out on our before sample. Here's a side-by-side -side on the before and after. Honestly, I tried looking for a difference. I wanted there to be one, but I genuinely do not see a difference between the samples. Time to finish up the oil change now, and then I'll run the car until it's at operating temperature, and then we'll continue on with our second set of testing. I'll be back with you with the next set of decibel readings from the inside and outside. The second set of results are in. You can see that we picked up 69 average decibels on the outside of the car using the decibel reader. So that might be a misnomer though, because I have noticed that after swapping the plugs and adjusting the gapping, that there's a bit of a deeper rumble to the idle sound. So that could be a contributing factor, but either way, the noise didn't go down. And inside the cabin, the reading was essentially exactly the same. Onwards to round two of the compression test. I just finished all the compression retesting and the wet test on cylinder four. And check this out. Right when I was starting to lose a little bit of faith in this, I am really confused and really happy about what I'm looking at. This is 189 PSI on cylinder four, our bad cylinder. Looking at the total results now, the confusion continues, and I don't know if there was a glitch in the matrix, but I'm seeing some odd things here. The first is that there's a big outlier on the wet result for cylinder one compared to before. Second, and remember this product is supposed to raise the compression of the cylinders, you can see that the first three dry tests are actually on average lower than before. So we're moving the opposite direction. However, none of this I'm going to say even matters because look at the dramatic improvement on cylinder 4. So this one has jumped right back up and normed itself with all the new compressions, which I'm going to take as a huge win. Now I'm excited to see this last part. Let's dive back under the valve cover and see what the cleaning effect was. And the big reveal? It's exactly the same. I was hoping to see that Liquamoly promo video shine when I popped off the valve cover, but truly it looks exactly like it used to. I rolled the before tape to compare and it really does look the same. So who knows, if I pulled off the pan, which is something I wasn't willing to do for this test, maybe it would look a little bit cleaner and sure there's plenty of other areas in the engine that the oil flows through and those could be looking great, but from what I'm looking at here, it looks the same. So cylinder 2 is in its intake stroke, so let's go down there and take a quick look at it. We're looking for any cleaning that might have happened at or below the oil ring zone on the cylinder wall, really low down there by the piston face. And it's pretty difficult to tell if there's been a change because it's just been hard to get pictures and video consistently around each cylinder. And although there's a little bit of cleaning around the edges, potentially, it's uh, pretty hard to say it's attributed to this cleaning product. And what you're seeing on screen now are the cylinder walls of cylinder 1, 3, and 4. Based on what I could observe, and it seems like there's a bit of a pattern inside each cylinder in terms of the exhaust side being slightly more clean than the intake side, I can't say that I've noticed a difference after this cleaning. 
So the million dollar question, does Liquimali engine flush work? Well, I'd say that you have to look at your data and depending on what product attribute you're after, maybe the answer is yes and maybe it's no. For me, it didn't change the main thing that I was looking for, which was the cleaning effect. However, it might have changed a really significant problem that I uncovered early on. So I would say at the very least for the effort that it takes, it's worth a try. Thanks for watching. See you next time. Easter egg. While you're thinking of subscribing, look at what I'm going to be testing next. Ceratec from Liquimali.